welcome a very 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 big welcome to all of you to hear our very favorite author shibu gochuri who will be in conversation with a very dynamic intellectual very well read young and spirited uh, lady mriganka go and the book they will be discussing today is amongst the believers the book has been drawing a phenomenal response uh, and we are very happy to see shibu going from strength to strength with this book and we look forward to a very engaging session this evening so without further ado i will first introduce uh, the moderator this evening riganka go who is currently working as a state aided college teacher uh, at uh, umesh chandra college department of management uh, she qualified the ugc net in 2018 she has secured first class in both her graduation and post graduation in finance from goenka college of commerce and business administration uh briganka has around 10 research papers uh in her name uh and um uh, of national and international repute she's doing her phd from vidya sagar university on finance inclusion she's also a social activist as she works for the underprivileged children of the rural areas of birbhum thank you briganka it's a great pleasure to have you at the readers and writers club for the very first time and thank I'm you so much over to the questions and i'm sure you're going to bring out the very best from our very esteemed author shibu kochuri this evening there is a gentleman uh shibu is uh, one of our favorite uh, authors who's been on our journey at the readers and writers club since 2021 and we completely adore him and i'm sure the members do as well so uh he's going to discuss his book amongst the believers with mriganka uh kochri si shibu the best selling and award winning author of men and dreams in the the laudhar and faith and the beloved he's a graduate of the prestigious national defense academy uh, kandak wasla he has served in the indian navy and commanded two warships post his retirement he has executed hydroelectric projects in the kaveri basin in karnataka bias river basin in himachal and the tista river basin in sikkim He holds a postgraduate degree in defense studies from Chennai University and an MA in English literature from Pune University. Shibu has changed a uh, track from the snow-clad mountains to the blue oceans and has been associated with the setting up of a shipping company in India. Amongst the believers, a suspense thriller is his third book a passionate and committed writer shibu creates a magical world of fiction but around a very well researched background the author was born in kochi kangrapadi and now lives in bangalore with his wife and daughter shibu welcome you are family as i always say in on our online sessions i cannot wait to host you offline in kolkata with your next book wishing you all the very best have a fantastic conversation and looking forward to a great response from our members thank you so much thank you mona thank you so much a very good evening to one and all thank you so much mona for such a generous and a cordial reception thanks to ahava readers and writers club for allowing us the platform so that we can interact ecstatically with some of the eminent authors and some of our favorite authors too and our today's discussion is going to be on this book amongst the believers by 
one of the best selling authors of our time scorchery c shibu who has recently been recognized and shortlisted for sahitya sparsh awards 2025 correct me if i'm wrong sir anywhere in your introduction and i must say that this book is a spy thriller quite a page turner and of course it you know engages the readers completely with every single page it transforms the readers into a world where they understand how the spies actually work how they actually act and it is kind of you know a pulse pounding narrative a pulse pounding narrative i must say so i have multiple questions to ask you sir multiple questions in my mind actually but me i just begin by asking you then how did you come up with this innovative title amongst the believers a very innovative title which is exclusively revealed in the middle of the book i won't say where and how because i don't want to give away too much of information regarding the novel because it is for the, our readers to enjoy it and to go through it go through every page of it but i i just want our readers to know and i myself would like to know that how did you get this how did you craft this title all together sir thank you prakash uh, and uh, thanking all the readers and our uh, readers club yes the selection of the title is a process which happens uh, initially did not uh, come naturally to me when i was writing the book so this book i started writing it has taken me about 2 uh, years in writing about 2000 man okay. writing hours somewhere along the line as the plot uh, shapes up and as the characters fall into place your you know the the themes keep churning in your mind as to what would be a befitting title so the uh, story is if in in a nutshell it's about the life of people who are caught amidst the turmoil of hardcore believers hardcore believers fanatics or you know there's a degree of separation depending on whom you ask someone will say they're firm in their belief some will say they cross the line and they're fanatics but whatever it may be it's set in a scenario where people are caught in the midst of a set of believers who believe in what they are doing right or wrong so in those conditions what happens to the people who are caught what is the value system of the people who are uh, you know doing whatever they are doing right and wrong and how the whole thing pans out and that's a reality which has been happening in our in the world for good about last 30 years or 40 years intensely in various places where it turns out into war warfare and there is a lot of talk about this this kind of how people are willing to fight for their beliefs give up their lives kill people and which to a normal uh, person looks completely out of sync depending on uh, what is fed to you through the media or what you read so one of the efforts has been in the book to get into what i call the psyche of the uh, suicide bomber or a suicide terrorist who is willing to give up his life for the cause that he believes in and equally the not so good practices on what they do with the people whom they come across in a battle scenario or who are in the way of life supporting them or against them and what happens in that life so the title is truly reflective of what happens to those people who are caught in the midst of the believers and one thing i tell you actually when i picked the title and i checked on this this is a very similar mm-hmm. sounding title by vs naipaul yeah it's called mm-hmm. Am- among the believers it is not you know okay. if you ask me that that's on the other side that's on the positive side where okay. he is talking about the the belief system and you know it's islamic journey they call it so this is again it's of course about uh, the belief system it's, uh, amongst the believers it's after i finished and you know finalized on my title and i was searching i found oh my god there is another book by none less than vs naipaul which is similar sounding but then i said okay i've decided the title and i couldn't think of a better title for this book which depicts what i want to say then you know once you read it people will relate to it as to how the title kind of fits into the theme of the book absolutely absolutely because i uh, while reading the book i myself understood that what this title is indicating what is it all about that is why i wanted to ask you about it but as a um, a story a story it has got two important aspects one is the development of the plot and the other is the sketching of the characters so my, what i would know from you uh, i mean like which one do you think is more challenging and which one do you do first you develop the plot first or you sketch the characters first because very often 
we hear some of the authors saying that I have this plot in my mind first and there are Fregon sketching the characters. But there are some of the other authors who opine that no, I somewhere met this character, I thought of this character, I wanted to share the story of this character and then the story got knitted all together over the character and then the entire novel was born. So to you, which one comes first, the plot development or the uh, character creation for sure? I would not say which comes first or second. I will say that uh, in my preparation for writing any novel, I focus on character sketching irrespective of whether I'm writing a novel or not. So I finished my second novel in 2020. And from 2021 onwards, I was doing my character sketching. Character sketching is that, you know, it's a purely about a power of observation. It could be from people whom you have directly met, maybe in a train journey, maybe in a bus journey, maybe in a taxi maybe in a restaurant, maybe in a flight, maybe in a meeting, maybe in a, you know, a financial closure, wherever, wherever you are, you meet people and whenever you find something interesting about an individual, maybe a man or a woman, which you think kind of a trait, which you think makes him or her, you know, stand out a little bit, you capture that and write it down, not relating to that individual, only the trait. So over a period of time, so you sketch that and then think of as where this trait could fit into a character whom you could use in the novels as you're writing or the theme or the plot as you develop. So when I started writing this novel, I had 200 characters sketched, outline sketched, I would say, not fleshed out, outline sketched. Oh and from God. there I do some mix and matching and then, you know, uh, develop the characters to the plot. I personally believe that, you know, the characters coming out live to a reader is the most important factor. Because uh, irrespective of how good a plot is, how good a theme is, unless the characters come live, I do not believe that, you know, you're doing justice to what you're writing. And readers should be able to relate and connect. The reader, of course, will not agree with many of the things which my characters are doing, but that aside. But they should be able to feel that, you know, that this, yes, this character is live. And you can, like you said, no, you can feel the pulse of the character. So to that extent, I start with character sketching. Then, of course, in any novel writing, uh, it's like the plot has to be developed and the characters have to fit into the plot and then they have to play as along. So it is not only just the characters and the plot, it's the evolved evolution of the character in the, in the, in the novel. Because you will see that you know, there is always a development of the character from the beginning to the end. You know, it is not the same and there's some journey of theirs, something which they've gone through, some pleasant, some not so pleasant, maybe at times uh, very terrible experiences, some of which make even the readers feel, uh, you know, to maybe laugh with you, cry with you or, you know, empathize with the characters. That, that is the way you look at it. So the character sketching and uh, the characters as you develop, you define a character and you know you define a maybe a lady or a woman character or a male character and then define a certain set of characteristics which you have in your mind and then as you go ahead often it's the editor who tells you whether your character is behaving in a pattern which is reasonable because some okay. of the times you know every author has got a temptation that at some point you you're not happy with the way things are thing you make the character do something just to make your match with the plot then of course the editor will tell you that that is not correct. You define the character like this. Now you cannot make him do a jumping jack at one point just to suit your plot. So those kind of things come in, but otherwise, yes, uh, the character development along with the plot. And at some stage, the whole thing has to play out in your mind that, you know, the time, space, characters, plot, all have to play together in your mind. Then only you're able to steer it well, the way you want. Right, right, right. So you you have particularly focused intently on your characterization, I believe. I mean, your characters are so meticulously drawn that, that say, I would like to start with one of the male protagonists of your novel, Khusru. I would start with this character. This character is so innovative in a way that he's a terrorist, but he's good at heart. So it's kind of an oxymoron, right? I mean, there are so many shades to this character. I, I like we know that there is nothing called black and white. We all have gray shades. So Khusru specifically depicts a character who definitely has gray shades. And this and drawing this kind of a character uh, takes a lot of imagination, a lot of study, a lot of understanding. 
So I want you, sir, to introduce our character Khusru to the readers who haven't picked up the book yet. What kind of a character is this? How have you developed this character? What went into your mind while you were developing such a grey shaded character like Khusru, who goes on to play one of the major roles in the entire uh, novel, sir? This is built built on a very uh, basic concept that you know uh, when people resort to violence, you start with a cause. You believe in a cause, so let's say that you are in an occupied territory and you feel that. Uh, the occupying force is not fair to the people and what is happening is not correct so you think that you should protest maybe take up arms against them what happens along the line is that you know the once you are start taking up the gun your understanding of right and wrong goes completely haywire and uh, it's like there's you no know, violence begets violence vengeance begets uh, you know vengeance so once the the many of the people never realize when you get into this line as to when they cross the line and when they cross over so irrespective of let's say uh, to give you a very simple example the ongoing gaza crisis the palestinian the the hamas or the, the terrorists or freedom fighters whatever they call themselves they went into israel and killed 700 odd people now after that it is very difficult when you when you have taken that step of going and killing 700 innocents who are not soldiers who are not taking up arms against you but innocent uh, soldiers of course there will be reprisal from that side and they will be very fierce and somewhere along the line right and wrong just gets blurred out so the people who went from the side many of them would have been believers who feel that the people of palestine or gaza have been subjugated not treated well Uh, they are they deserve better and they are fighting for a cause that may have been the belief but once you go and kill 700 people or 800 innocents in that cause and come back then what happens after that it's only a degree of you know who's 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 more on the wrong then there's a right the sense of right and righteousness goes away so similarly there are many people who get caught in conflicts like this beat in gaza beat in syria beat in kashmir beat in iraq beat in iran so many places that uh, irrespective of what you say a man who takes up arms finally it's a human being he may be a terrorist he may have done many wrong things but he is still a human being so there will be a certain human aspects to people and one of the aims has been to bring out what you say that you know somebody who has been misled what happens to them at some point they find that there's no there's no there's no return it's like crossing the rubicon it's beyond it there's no coming back so these are unfortunate things it happened to us even during the khalistan movement in the 80s we had sort of a, many of our youths who got carried away like this who took up arms and did you know things which they would not have even thought of otherwise but it of course got settled down and many of them were able to come back to the society why i am bringing this out is it is equally important for the readers to know that uh, it is very easy to brand you know in the mainstream media and call a guy a terrorist who takes up arms but there is a human side to it now what is being said in the background here is more than the individuals who are fighting for the cause if you have a military who is standing on the other side and using them like uh, pawns in the game or making them shikhandi then the whole thing changes and that's what is happening in our case in kashmir it is not your kashmiris who are fighting there's a proxy war which is using them as uh, pawns in the game which is happening from the other side so a lot of these aspects have been brought out and this guy has been brought out as an example as to what happens to people when you cross a line take up arms you find that it is such a vicious environment that uh, you get caught into it then you are only more and more into it you is very difficult to come out absolutely i mean this this it, it's very true that there is this humanly nature in every terrorist and every bad person whom we uh, label as bad but it is only a writer who can bring out the both the vices and the virtues of a person to the readers and can explain them that a particular character has both black and white shades now coming to the next character of this book this is one character that has struck me right from the very beginning and i always wanted to ask you right you know from the very first day that i started with this book this character is rekha the female protagonist of the novel both the male characters khushru and nand are still understandable but when it comes to rekha this character has layers and complications i must say i mean a very difficult character to create very meticulously very well 
crafted character she is not a conventional woman not a kind of woman whom we see every day in our lives she does everything that makes her life not so stable that makes her life go completely topsy turvy you know not a very common woman and you know she gets into all those areas she gets into all those domains which a woman of her stature both personal and professional would not dare to barge on but she still does that she goes through very difficult pathways she's a very straightforward i mean a woman of substance always taking her own decisions not really going through the conventional ways she's doing things on her own and everything about her is so different is so distinct from what i have read in all my i mean what i have read in all these years about uh, other characters this character is very very different according to me so what what went to your mind while you developed this character any inspiration behind this character there is no one individual whom i can say that i saw this lady and for this lady read rekha the answer is no there is no such uh, direct one to one uh, relationship no but i have seen women in my life who are uh, who are what i call independent in their thinking financially independent who steer their life and live life on their terms the way they want so now traditionally uh, in most of the patriarchal societies that is considered to be a privilege of the man that you know the women are you know uh, in many ways the society has defined roles which is not easy for them to break out and uh, act on their own but i have seen women like this in the 21st century who have come out of iits and iims who got into the business world steering businesses taking out family business which is traditionally in india you know a male bastion where they don't give the businesses to the women so they have broken out of this mold and they have done things so there are people who have you know capable of doing things and uh, doing things differently that is one side of the story so you are talking about a woman who is a, a individual who is capable of thinking and acting on her own that's one second aspect is that she is a passionate kathak dancer and a lot of the times creative people have the cap- capability to go beyond what normally others may or may not do that's another aspect that brings in that that suddenly you will always find in the society also you will find as artists and creative people normally they are the ones who you know are not much worried about lines and you know, the norms and they would like to go which the way they think that is right and wrong yes and the third part of course is what i call you know that uh, love is blind there is no definition on what a man or woman can do or cannot do for love and that has been proven time and again historically all times and all time all parts of the world all times of the society that has been one factor which has never been defined that there are so many things individuals both men and women who have crossed so many barriers in the name of love so all these three put together so this character has been developed and there are many things that uh, happens to her so a lot of the times the uh, one of the aspects that have been brought out clearly here is that you know of course she gets caught into the again the amongst the believers and the life what happens to her there those are the times when you know the people think you so know there is always crossing the line is one thing uh, living on your terms is one thing there is a saying which says you know that uh, discretion is a better part of valor when the love decides that you know you decide to go you go so i guess the character is created like that and one thing i've done is Uh, many of the characters this has been i have tell my editor also this that when i write i don't think about right and wrong and you know limits and things like that because it's called when you get into the getting into the skin of the character takes a fair amount of time so when you're writing so let's say you're decided this character and uh, you're getting into the skin of the character and deciding the situations it takes a fair amount of time maybe a week maybe two weeks before you think you've got your mind into it and when you start writing then you'll be writing that one characters sketching and that story of one chapter continuously maybe for a week maybe for a month maybe for even 3 months till that is complete so at that time whatever you what you know the writer what we call it you know getting into the flow if you got a you know something in your mind and it is flowing then you just write and of course it's later on the editor who tells you okay your line ends here chop or this is absolute trash cut 
that i accept you know you you go to like uh, editor is like a sparring partner i must thank kirti ramachandra the lady who has edited this book so she is also quite uh, you know quite blunt and she says also that this is okay this is not okay and that's Uh, that's something which is it makes your job easy. Okay, you write, and then she's there to you know not cut you to size, but kind of draw boundaries which uh, wherein your book stays within limits. So in both ways, because you know getting into the writing and writing of a character, it's not easy. It's always, and many of the times you also get into the agonies and sufferings of the people. And you know, I have had this thing. You know, when I wrote my first book, and later when I read through one of the characters who was you know lost his family in the book and all that. I got quite upset reading it. Oh my God, this guy has gone through so much. So you yourself were the story. So that's also part of the thing that you also go through their joys and sorrows when you're writing. And the writing is in a flow. There is no particular uh, theme. Yes, of course, you do pick out individuals' traits, as I told you. You know that individually each of the traits. Some men would have done it somewhere. Somebody would have done dance to some extreme. Somebody has done trekking to some extreme. somebody who has been through difficult times in their own way so you put all this together and then yes the character comes through right right so in your in the entire conversation while describing khushru and rekha uh, there's one thing that you're talking about is love right which um, there is this love angle in the book there is a major love angle in the book and this is kind of a forbidden love not the sort of love which is socially accepted or which is accepted by the normal people of our country it's a love between i mean little bit little bit of information i'll give it's a love between a terrorist and a doctor and a kathak dancer also because she is both a doctor and a kathak dancer so this is also an unconventional love story a kind of love story which um, is so beautiful to read on i mean while going through it i realized that a woman gets everything in life maybe she gets um her professional dreams done she gets her education done she gets a, a good life she gets a good stature she gets everything but there is one thing she is always in search of and that is pure and passionate love uh, a kind of love that she can rely upon a kind of love that she craves for that she yearns for and rekha has that kind of love for kusru which obviously is not accepted by the society no no i mean the society doesn't kind of give a nod to it so this love angle is also very unique in a way that it is going to grasp the readers and will make them go through the i mean every page of the book till the book ends for the love story for sure so can you please explain a bit about it sir of course if you uh, if you want to talk in that line see that uh, forbidden love is of course that's a so social way of saying it okay but then uh, it is nothing abnormal or it is not unheard of that that a woman who has been a prisoner of a of a captive that you falls in love with your captive or your captor to say that they call it a stockholm syndrome where yes. you know as a captive you sympathize with your captor and with their cause and their challenges and sometimes you fall in love so this novel is a sequel to the first novel which i have written where their their initial interaction takes place and how she is kidnapped and how they live together in a you know they lock together and live in a hydroelectric project site for whatever reason that i will not say now those who want can read the book but what it means together is that the start point for this whole thing has been that they have not uh, planned to meet by design so mm -hmm. the khusru was a terrorist who was preventing a terror attack and ended up saving her her life in an amarnath yatra attack and then he is in a situation where she he has to let her go and she says enough for whatever reason that she decides that she has fallen in love with him they elope together to go to a hydroelectric project site and they live together for many months and after which she is again saved and brought back so there is a background to it where she has met this person and lived with him for some time and and there is a, a true uh, bonding which takes place uh, with them before this part of the novel takes place which is in the previous part in second part in this novel what what she is like by the book what you call married to a doctor as you said you know who has got everything in life but then she has was in love with somebody and that just does, doesn't go away it happens to all of us 
or if not all of us, some of us. There are many who say that, you know, uh, if you that is a very common theme in our Hindi movies and many of the movies where you say that you loved somebody and for whatever reason you could marry him or her and you move on in life and, you know, after some time you still, that memories never go away. The degree varies. Memories may stay with you, but you do not allow it to affect your life. But here is a person who decided that for whatever reason that she has become passionate about it and she goes chasing after it and it, of course, it ends up and, you know, into the story uh, in a way that is not uh, easily acceptable to people. So to say, for example, I'm, I have quoted this before also in my uh, talks to the people. The story of a girl from UP uh, who's now still on the, is in the death row for, she killed her parents, her brother, sister-in-law and a child, all because her parents did not allow her to marry a boy whom she wanted to marry. I mean, it's unbelievable. She's a double postgraduate. And uh, her the boy whom she wanted to marry was not up to the mark or loser, as the family used to call it. And initially, when the news, this I'm telling you, this even took place somewhere around 2011-12. When the news came out in the media, I didn't believe it. I said, you know, how would a girl who's a double postgraduate be so cold blooded as to kill her parents and her brother and sister-in-law and a small child, all for lo loving and marrying somebody? It's an extreme step. I mean, unbelievable, unimaginable. But then later on, it came about that she had colluded with her lover and then, you know, drugged up with her family and then axed them to death. Unbelievable. But she's on the death row now. So women and men, in the name of love, people have done so many stupid things. This is nothing new. The only thing is, when you read about it, if you have not come across it, yes, it does seem strange to you. But love does make you do things which normal people will not do otherwise. But well, that's the power of love, as they say. Absolutely, absolutely, sir. But sir, like you are giving us, I mean, you are providing us with so many case studies, case studies of UP and others. And while going through the book, I felt that this book is so much loaded with information. So anyone who reads the book will understand that writing a book of this sort requires an intensive research, a very in-depth research. One needs to stay updated on subjects like current affairs, geopolitics, history, and whatnot. So it means there is a lot of study needed, a lot of study needed to uh, get through the information and then to jot it down and then to uh, produce a book like this. So what is your research process? How do you do your research? What is it that comes into play uh, when you're doing your research? And because it's, 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 it's an intense research, right? An in-depth one. A very uh, uh, not not that you know you're reading something you are listening to something and then you're having a plot in your mind you're writing it down no so much of information you have provided us so much information about spies about isi about cia about so many other things about so many foreign countries and it also covers a huge period of time you've covered a huge period of time. you've talked about so many events i'll not mention all of them, but yes, you've mentioned about so many important events, so many important events across the world. So a lot of study is needed. So how do you do your research, sir? I think you answered the question partially in the beginning. You know, it's about keeping abreast of current events and events as they happen. That's very important because okay. that is what keeps you abreast. And that, that's a very important part, which I do. I do keep abreast of whatever is happening in the world. So whether it is 9-11, whether it is 26-11, whether it is the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, whether it's the American invasion of Iraq, whether it's American invasion of Afghanistan. These are all events which were covered substantially in the media as they took place. So you have to keep abreast of that to have an idea as to what happened and you have to form your own opinion. And a lot of the times what is scripted by the media is what is each government has got a lot of say in that and what is fed to the media. And uh, you will find three, four media giving the same information with three, four points of view. And the truth lies somewhere in between. So this is one part which uh, you, it's a reading habit and keeping abreast of current affairs. That's a re requirement because what happened to the subcontinent to, you know, beginning with, because the 79, when the Soviet attacked the uh, invaded Afghanistan, I do not know if you're aware of this, there was an Olympics in 1980, which was held in Moscow which was boycotted by U.S. and many of the European countries because of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan of 1979. 
and after 1980 they are the ones who uh, opened up this pandora of jihadis to fight russians and bring in people in the name of jihad from all over the world to afghanistan to fight russian because they couldn't afford to put the boots on the ground and they use pumped in money to pakistan so 79 to 89 they give so much in arms and ammunition that they finally succeeded in what they thought at that time that communism was a the greatest threat to the western democracy in doing so they created a monster that is your you know the jihadi organizations and jihadi monsters were created by them which subsequently took over afghanistan and then afghanistan went from bad to worse and the pakistanis who believed that if the jihadis can take on the that time the the largest superpower in the world the ussr they can you know knock off india and they put on all those people to india from the time the war got over from 18 and 90 onward these the same jihadis who were funded and sponsored by them started spilling into india so from that it went on from 91 92 till about that Kar kargil war 99 it is an intense period till they thought they could get away with it that 99 was a turn turnover point when they tried the last step and then of course we hit back so hard that they had to back out and then they realized that this is not going to get them what they wanted so there are so many things which play in this it is not just uh, <clears throat> not just events as reported in the media so there is there's so many agencies the isi in pakistan was groomed by cia during that period to fight the russians because russian kgb was very strong the kgb which existed in ussr was as good as the cia they were very good it's after the breakup of the uh, soviet union that kgb was disbanded and their their intelligence capability got diluted but cia trained and brought up isi to a level they are considered one of the best in that you know west asia south east asia or south asia region that doesn't happen by accident so when you write a story of this nature events when you connect like this uh, on what is going on in south asia or in let's say the afghanistan pakistan and in that area which has got no connected to iraq because they have created a problem there iran has come into picture so all these people and there is a war which is going on in area which is you know syria which is supported by iran from to one faction russia with one faction us with another faction so the, when you write a book of this nature unless you tell the readers why and how i believe it will be you know incomplete so a fair amount of information has been given and i am a firm believer that anyone who reads a book should get a little more than what he or she could have possibly got from the media directly from the media a different perspective some more information some more possibilities what makes one think you should not accept whatever you are told just because it's coming from bbc or it from some american channel or for that matter any indian channel don't believe it anything in blindly use your uh, you must be a discerning viewer and you must be a discerning reader one of the efforts in this has been in addition to making it a thriller is to promote what i call it you know, readers should feel that okay i have learned something maybe more about pakistan afghanistan iran maybe something about russian army maybe something about ukraine what happens how battles are fought how it is lost and i believe that you know then if for a discerning reader it should be a you know a good experience to have this kind of value addition reading a thriller which otherwise many people think that reading a fiction novel thriller is you know it's time pass and it's no value addition to you right <clears throat> so as we are running short of time there are many more questions that i want to ask you but uh, it is that i have to take the a step back but there's it, it, very shortly i would like to know from you two things just two things before mona takes over just two things that you are from you were from this defense background yet you did your one of your masters in literature and you got into writing which is quite a very uncommon thing so how did you think about doing it was it planned i mean you always thought of becoming a writer or is it and it was obviously there was definitely a plan because you did your masters in literature so there was definitely some sort of planning not totally accidental but then what is it that made you do so defense literature two two different backgrounds i have to say that's one thing and the other thing is so what is your message to our budding writers because i'm in a college where i teach i'm in a government college i do my phd from a i'm i'm still doing my phd from a government institution and there are a lot of people a lot of young students 
who aspire to become writers but they just don't know what kind of path to follow because there is no such common pathway to it so one who wants to become a writer or, or has this writing thing, thing in their mind what tips do you have for them if you can answer these two questions for me so and for our readers too the first part yes it was by design that i had always wanted to be a writer it goes back to my school days i was privileged to have studied in a, one of those top schools in kerala called loyola school which is in trivandrum and that school had that kind of uh, environment vibes where you know creativity was promoted so the aspiration to be a writer was right from the school days and subsequently i went on to uh, another good great institution called dali college which is in indore again another place where you you know you feel those creative vibes in your environment so that further honed and but of course once i joined the national defense academy the whole thing got oriented towards defense so your writing was always about uh, military tactics strategy and anti submarine warfare and bang for the buck as the people outside called it and what translates to how to kill more people at less cost that those are the kind of subjects that we used to do and then as a career soldier i tried writing but you just can't it, you know your mind is so much into what you're doing uh, because you have to stay ahead of technology and and that to well ahead i mean to give an example when the russia ukraine war which is going on now a new facet which came into being was this using of drones for surveillance and using of drones and you know normal the gps for using a weapon delivery so now you find that you know people are taking a drone and taking a video camera and somebody is sharing it like as if he is playing a video game and following a truck or a tank or something and be blowing it up so the battlefield has become what you call the 100% surveillance that you cannot have any movement which are hidden so you are vulnerable to attack now which is not the case previously there some amount of surprise which you could create so there is a kind of stalemate from both sides both sides are uh, other than you know sending drones and firing missiles at each other they're not able to move their arms and the heavy machinery or the heavy tanks and you know the uh, large amount of troops to advance and occupy a place this was uh, something similar happened in the first world war when they used to do something called trench warfare where they just ended up killing each other because anyone trying to cross you could never cross the trench so that very so very tough the second world war saw that this was changed over with uh, tanks and mechanized infantry and aircraft and you know so the mobility overtook that uh, challenge so today if you are to sitting in that you know i'm sure the military guys who thinking is saying that if they are using the drones what is giving the direction to the drone satellites not the satellites off that's you know it will become phenomenal destruction to social infrastructure of the whole world any anything of that kind so these are things which uh, you know when you start thinking when you are sitting in a military man you will not have time to think about fiction so you will be so so engrossed in all this thing that if we happen to fight in this area you know i'm sure my peer group will be sitting there and thinking as to if, what do we do this could happen to us so then how do we face it how do we go one step further this is a challenge so during the military career no i could not so it's only after i left in 2005 and i started working in hydroelectric projects that in 2009 i could start writing and then of course there is i have not looked back after that so and i have stopped reading fiction when i started writing clearly with an idea that you know that i want to spend my time writing and create a brand which is yours or style of writing which is yours and uh, so the doing of masters in whilst in service in english literature was a very deliberate decision because when i spoke to people when i wanted to start out writing and the some some people who gave me guidance said you do a masters in english literature you will get an idea as to how the university looks at subjects and what should be known to a guy or a girl or a woman or a man who, who wants to enter this field and that was by design that it decided to do that masters from pune university and it is an eye opener quite an eye opener and it does come in quite handy in uh, what when you write because you have an idea about how that uh, the english writing has developed over the years and with that of course it took me that the 18 and completed my started writing in 2009 20 years down the line but still okay it comes in handy it gives you a framework of mind which helps definitely this is one part as far as my writing goes as for the aspiring writers go the <clears throat> one part is that the, the first thing i say is that you know like 
an ounce of action speaks far better than tons of talk so anyone who wants to be an aspiring writer he can discuss with a thousand people he can keep discussing but if he writes a page i think he'll have made one step in the right direction than talking that's one part so anyone who wants to write first start writing simple as that that's one part second is there are some uh, what i call the uh, shortcuts to success in testing yourself out so to say that i'll give an example to say that let's say you look at a let's say an event which happened something of some uh, let's say scandalous event which has taken place maybe like the event which i took place you know where a woman is actually you know suppose you killed her parents so you know even if that is true or that is not true as a uh, as an author those who are starting to write if you are looking at let's say the thriller series you take that background and for a moment imagine that she is actually innocent and then rewrite that whole story and think of a scenario wherein she is innocent and she has been framed by somebody that gives you a framework to work on to get your first thing going and you give an idea after some time whether you are able to write that kind of stuff or not that is one the second is love triangle which is what which will be more popular with the students and the young crowd will they'll be most happy reading the love triangle and writing about love triangle that of course i do not have uh, you know those are relationship based things which again there are enough incidents of you know relationship going sour and you know uh, where it turns to violence somebody killing each other in the name of love and the person who loved you the maximum is the one who come and kill you so other way of doing it is you pick up another incident like that and then you give you a view to it at why uh, how the story could have developed so that's one way of doing to hone your writing initially once you do that subsequently yes then you can forget that and uh, think of your own themes write the original things and start writing that's one second is what i say is power of observation that means uh, anything writing requires a like either it is character sketching you just can't sketch somebody out of the air you need to have details and some framework and what happens and how to do it and all that so i given an idea let's say a small thing will be your look at your one of the friends you know even when he's walking ahead of you but, but looking from behind itself you can make out that girl is your friend even though you cannot see her face the way she moves or you know something very characteristically uh, those are the kind of traits which you observe the way a man speaks or how people respond to such situations how people respond when they are to lose money how people respond when they are to get money how people respond when they are succeeded or how people respond when they have these are things which will be happening all around you so of course if you are not in a place then you have to be observant that i said no travel in bus travel in taxi travel in a train and you go and sit in a restaurant observe that one part if you cannot observe and be observant to write about people and write about what makes an individual different uh, only creativity in thinking cannot give you these details you need these details to work on so that your whatever your talent that you want to write comes up so this is the first part is it you know like i say get going and start writing you know once you write and you get going then you will have an idea where you stand and i always tell that do not mistake your flowery language or command of the language with your ability of storytelling writing a novel is storytelling i'm telling fiction i'm not talking about non fiction is in a, your ability to tell a story and among your friends you would have noticed that the best storyteller will not have the best command of the language he may not even the, the be the best orator but he has a way of telling a story which makes it interesting and people listen to him so storytelling is also like that it is not about flowery shakespeare language or flowery you know poetic language where you can rattle off that doesn't make you a writer writer is the ability to tell a story in your own way in your own way and uh, that has to be your thing and it cannot be somebody else's thing so that that's all so, you know those who want to write get going and start writing uh, right absolutely and there are so many writing schools coming up these days teaching students how to write and how to pen down their thoughts so think these schools or these institutions are anyway relevant to uh, those who, who are aspiring to become writers one day or the other for the schools for making money they are important so that these people have to pay only then all the schools will run but right uh, right beyond, right beyond that beyond that see any kind of formal training will have its value 
Uh, see, my one of the things what I say this is, uh, unless you do a lot of writing as a part of your life, the, uh, sure. what I mean to say is that writing does not just come uh, by like that. So handling a language and writing takes a lot of practice. It's like telling an athlete, before you become an Olympian, you would have to run every day you know, in the morning, evening, you'll be jogging, you know, one hour, two hour, you'll be jogging or you'll be sprinting. So there'll be a lot of work that they do. So in that sense, if you look at writing, yes. So one of the things to do, the other way is that, let's say, simple things like, let's say, you these days, maybe a letter to an editor. It then gives you a chance to say that, you know, to give your power of expression, you want to check out, write a newspaper, which some of the newspapers do still cover worthwhile letters to the editor. You try on a subject in whichever part you're staying in, which you think is of importance. And that gives you an idea as to what is the level of writing that is required to get your uh, let's say readers letter published in a newspaper start point or something like this start small like this you know to groom your writing skills so you do that uh, two three times you will get an idea okay you have written once twice thrice it's not catching attention then you'll know that you need to you need to be better read you need to be you need to be writing better reading better and then only someone listen to you so the first part is that you know if you're you think that your writing skills are not up to the mark then you have to practice writing and fair amount of practice is required and I accept it, no deny. If you are not into this, then get into one of the formal schools. I have not been to one. I have seen many of them, but yeah. I, have, I have not comment on it. Whether they will benefit or not, I don't know. But extensive writing is required. You, It's like any other art. See, if you want to be a good dancer, you got to practice dancing. You want to be a good actor, you got to practice acting. So you got to be a good singer, you got to practice singing. So obviously, if you are a good writer, you got to keep writing. No, you can't say I was story. True, very true. But one day I just want to write. No, that will not work. I mean, it may no. work for some rare cases, but that will be more of a, an exception than the rule. Right, so, right. So it needs a lot of practice. Yes, absolutely. Now, of course, it needs it a lot of practice. Yeah, to be a writer because you know a, a lot of students they feel that it, writing is something that doesn't need practice because it's not like mathematics, it's not like physics, not like chemistry. So they feel that you know it it'll come to my mind one and I'll write it down. But it is so important for the budding writers to understand that extensive practice and proper and formal method of knowing how to write is so essential. And like the way one of the eminent authors like you is stating the fact that practice is so important. So can you please explain to our budding writers, it's just not about having a plot and writing it down or, or being very fluent in English. So having the ability to write it down. It is also about having command over the content, command over the grammar of it, command over the understanding of the plot. Isn't it so, sir? It is so, it is so. And uh, the see that uh, again, I'm telling that, you know, uh, aside of love triangle, love triangle maybe yes, you can, only talk about, you know, your affairs of the heart and, you know, you can play with words. But otherwise, any kind of writing requires a fair amount of research on what you're going to write. You know, how much of the background do you know and uh, how much of detailing will be required. Uh, reading a novel may look easy to you when you're reading it. it is, uh, this, this guy has said a story, so can I. Of course, all of us can tell a story. And all of us do have a story to tell. That's your life story. That's exclusive to yourself. That story can be told. But... Uh, good writing requires practice and how you practice it's for you to look into forums, magazines, newspapers, your online portals, where you get a writing opportunity, wherever you can get a writing opportunity, start writing. So over a period of time when you write and you know, when you people start appreciating what you're writing, that's the first recognition that you're getting. Okay. You across the benchmark that uh, someone wants to read what you've written. It may be a blog. If you don't have anything else, write a blog every day, create a blog, write. Whatever you see, observe, write. Because without practicing, if someone thinks that, you know, I want to be, a, you know, a judge, I've got a brilliant idea in my mind, I'll churn it out. Chances are that he's okay. going to be disappointed. He's going to be disappointed. Right, right. Thank you so much, sir, for such an engaging session. I thoroughly enjoyed the session, moderating the session. I hope our viewers have enjoyed it too. And I thereby request Mona to take over and to bring a tentative end to the session. Thank you so much, uh, Briganka.
for such an engaging and interesting conversation. We listen to Thank new you. elements uh, and new facets of Shibu's book this evening. Thanks uh, uh, to your very, very, uh, what should I say, uh, very sharp questions. Uh, I'm sure book lovers had a great time. So I can't thank you enough for this session. And uh, of course, Chibu, we are so proud of you. You've been nominated uh, for the Saitya Sprash Award 2025 and all flags up for you to be the winner. So congratulations. This is big news for us. And thank you once again on behalf of the Readers and Writers Club, Shibu, for trusting us, for uh, coming on board, for giving us time, and for such a such an engaging conversation that you had this evening. I thoroughly enjoyed. I'm a book lover, and I'm sure book lovers across the spectrum would have had a very very good time this evening. And you've made our Sunday completely worthwhile. Thank you so much to both of you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Shibu. Thank you, Ringanka. Thank you. Thank Mona. you so Thank much, Mona. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.